North America has a few big animals, but it's mostly dominated by smaller fauna that have learned to thrive in the amber waves of grain. However, America was once a continent like Africa, home to great beasts that made the bison look like a mid-sized megafauna. It also used to have predators like lions, hyenas, and cheetahs. But there's one relic of epochs long gone that still follows the old ways of the Pleistocene era. The pronghorn may be a product of its time, but sometimes good old-fashioned lessons still hold up in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal info. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube. And thank you to Brian for the creation of this episode's artwork. To check that out, you can see it. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter at LD Taxonomy or visit us at LDTaxonomy.com. And today we're talking about one of the fastest ungulates west of the Mississippi. But more on that later. I don't know why I gave it one so many of. qualifiers. It's the fastest ungulate. <laughs> it's the fastest say. animal in North America. That's the um it's a, that's a superlative. It's in its high school yearbook it was most likely to be fastest. <laughs> yeah. That'd be great to have an, an, a yearbook for humans. This is most likely to succeed, and this is this is Tim. He's most likely to be fastest. All he- yearbooks are yearbooks for humans. I have nothing to say to that. <laughs> I guess I guess you could have a yearbook for uh, your ob- uh, dog's obedience school, so they can remember all the friends they made along the way. <laughs> Hags. Um. Yeah. We're talking about the prong pronghorn, the pronghorn antelope, the the second um, horn based animal we that you have done in the last couple of episodes. Horn based North American mammal, ungulate. Yeah, e- go going even deeper, but yeah, this is it's it's called the pronghorn, but it it's also called colloquially. Uh, the American antelope, the prongbuck, or the prairie antelope. This must be the antelope that they mention in the uh, Home on the Range. Yes, because we we mentioned this in when we did our the buffalo episode of, a couple years ago now. That there are neither buffalo or antelope in North America at all. Um, there's bison and then there's pronghorns. But I don't think during Home on the Range times, whenever that was, 1810 times, um, that anybody knew that. Yeah, they probably called them both bison and buffalo. They can be for, they can be forgiven. But the pronghorns are for oft- now. often called the pronghorn antelope. Right. Yes. But the reality is, is that they are not antelopes. But we'll get more. We'll get into that with the taxonomy. So we're gonna call it here. The dashy dashing deerish thing, um, and Andy the antelope, because <laughs> it's not an antelope. But as I meant, as I alluded to earlier, it's time to taxonomize this. It's in a kingdom you know, love, and are in, and that kingdom is the one and only Animalia. Uh, that's not going to change. The phylum is Chordata, that changes occasionally. Uh, the class is Mammalia, that changes more often, and the order is Artiodactyla which is even-toed ungulates. Uh, lots of animals fall into this category. This super family is Giraffoidae. So this means that rather than being related, this is where they branch off from being related to antelopes because instead they're, they're more related to giraffes and the okapi, which we both animals we have done in the past. And the family, and so from here on out, the pronghorn is kind of in a class of its own. There, there aren't very many other members of the family, subfamily, genus, and obviously it's the only one of the species. Uh, so the family is Antilocapridae, 
uh, which means, which sounds, looks like it means uh, anti-goat, not a goat, Antilocapridae. The subfamily is Antilocaprinae, with a big N instead of a, instead of a D. Uh, the genus is Antilocaprini, Antilocaprini, uh, <laughs> and the species is Americana. Antilocaprini sounds like a, like a delicious Starbucks beverage. Um, and especially when you put Americana on it, it just sounds perfect. Or a type of pasta. So, Intilla Caprini Americana. Yeah, that's definitely a, that's definitely like a traditional Italian dish that has been Americanized at Olive Garden. <laughs> yes. Uh, we basically, by Americanized, I mean like added a lot of salt. So yes. And, and, and cheese. Intilla Caprini Americana. Oh, so good. Salt and cheese. Two, two, two staples of my diet. Aren't you playing through that game? So, <laughs> <laughs> you do have to... Yeah, I'm playing through uh, Salt and Cheese. It's Salt and Sanctuary, but you do have to cheese a lot of bosses, so I, I do end up being like Salt and Cheese. Just stand, stand in the back of the room and shoot them with arrows instead of actually fighting. Because it's, it's a very hard game and it makes me scared. Um, th- since we're in the business of naming things... It's time for my favorite part of the show, Critter Groups. The part, of, the part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question, and that question is the same every time. What is the name of the group of this animal? What is the term of venery for this animal? Or what is the collective noun? It's all the same. If you saw a group of pronghorns, would you call it Joe? A, a band of pronghorns. B, a drove of of pronghorns, C, a brilliance of pronghorns, or D, a run of pronghorns? Hmm. I think I'm going to go with drove. Seems like a good, hearty, western plains word. Final answer. Final answer. Incorrect. And the answer was banned. Okay. Also, uh, yeah, I almost put rut here, but I think that would have been too on the nose. Um, yeah. Band. It's a band of pronghorns. Uh, and we'll talk about how they form up into bands in a little bit. <laughs> uh, by the way, the pronghorn was first officially described and taxonomized by Lewis and Clark. Makes sense. They were the first uh, is natu- naturalists to make their way west on a scientific expedition. There you go. Interesting. From America. From from the colonies, <laughs> so much, so many qualifiers here. But anyway, yes, they they made their way west and and uh, noticed that there were these antelope things, and they called them pronghorns. Also, as an aside, I found out that antelope is what's called a waste basket taxon, which is just it's where it's how they classify animals that don't fall into any other category. Uh, so if it's a if it's a ruminant, which means it chews the cud, and it's not a bovine, it makes it. It's just it's classified as an antelope. Oh, and it also has to live in the um, in the old world. So it lives in uh, anywhere but in the eastern hemisphere. It's um, it's the category for when taxonomy breaks down and become and re- it makes you realize. That sometimes the natural world defies categorization. Yeah, they're like, where do we put this? Well, let's just dump it in the antelope pit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The La Brea um, tar pits. Them, that <laughs> and have it sink for thousands of years. Do you want to hear about what this, what this antelope, not antelope, looks like? Sure. Well, it looks like an antelope. <gasps> Done. Done deal. We're done. No, it's uh, it looks, it does definitely looks very antelopish. Uh, it's it's got short tan fur on its back, neck, and legs. Uh, it's got cream colored fur on its jaw, belly, tush specifically, and uh, in stripes on its neck. If you're a male, females are like a lot of animals. They're they're on the plainer side, and males are more uh, they're more their colors are more pronounced. Um, the pronghorn has a, that long deer-like snout and uh, males have this black streak that goes starts at their nose goes all the way up their snout and stretches to their brow so their faces are actually this really kind of uh um 
stark i think is the word like a stark mottled mix of browns whites and blacks um which gives him a very distinct distinct is the word not stark so it, it makes him look really cool actually um males also have two dark gray or black horns that uh are actually thick flat bones sticking out of their head um so they're not like deer wait wait no yes they're horns not antlers uh so they're not like deer but they're actually similar more similar than anything to the ossicones of giraffes and uh okapi because of the fact that they're covered in uh skin and keratin yeah so that brings us to I guess how big it is. I guess we have to talk about how big it is. Can't get around it. Lay it on us. Oh, okay. Well, welcome to the beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show. The part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the show that's introduced by you when you send an audio over self saying singing, or chittering. The words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail.com. We do have a new Measure Up intro this week. Hooray! It's I wish I could fi- do like, like a little like that. The sound of one of those, one of those party tongue things. What are those called? Anyway, oh, uh, <laughs> party <laughs> tongue things is the only thing I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> I have that is now the only thing that is uh, filling your mind. There's a uh, word for it, but it's feast or famine. We have like the next few weeks covered so if you've sent in a measure up or if you're planning on it and you don't hear it immediately don't worry we didn't forget you we just have a lot to get through but we're gonna get to all of them right and we have some we have a few that go the extra mile and we have a we have at least one that comes from many 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 miles away Ooh. but sounds more exotic more on that later um, but today we have a measure up from our friend Julia. You know Julia. Julia, the voice of the uh, I haven't heard stinger. Yeah, the the very last voice you hear on every episode, except Julia. for the the blooper. Oh, the blooper. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but let's, uh, let's without further ado, the listeners' favorite part of the show. Measure up. Hi, and go Mr. Joey and Mr. Carlos. So supportive to everyone yeah. involved. I am I am now very confident that I, I'm going to get this measure up down pat. Thanks to that encouragement. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much, Julia. And uh, thank you for sending in a new measure up intro. They, they've, they've been like really grieved at the the fact that we have gone through such a drought and they they I'm glad that they've uh, they're able to help us break the streak. Well, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We have been complaining about it every episode. So finally, <laughs> That's true. we got what, some what, people to What are we the persistent woman? What? The the parable the parable of the persistent woman or the parable of the uh the unjust judge? It's another like squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing. Um, okay, okay. There's lots of parables. There are. Not ringing a bell. It's a, there's more than a pair of parables. Let's talk about male length. Um, the pronghorn male is between 1.3 and 1.5 meters, or 4 feet and 3 inches, or 4 f- to 4 feet and 11 inches. We're going by the upper end of average. So how many pronghorns go into the height of the monk's mound... In Cahokia, in modern-day Illinois. Cahokia. Yeah. That's fun to say. Here's a hint. Cahokia was a large pre-Columbian urban center in the Mississippian culture, which was home to around 18,000 people at its peak in 11 AD. It's thought to have been some sort of religious center. Um, And the city has several man-made earthen mounds, which supported multi-story buildings the largest of which is monk's mound hmm but it challenges the idea of like the small tribes of north america pre-columbian exchange because it was like this huge city yeah how many people did you say 
eighteen thousand, and it was like six square miles, so it's like a pretty large settlement. But there were a lot of like there were a lot of individual tribes, but I guess they were they've they changed. Yeah. Over so apparently, I was centuries. trying to read about whatever this Mississippian culture is basically a collection of tribes around the Mississippi River that shared a culture or culture and language and stuff like that. But it's the Got biggest it. it was the biggest pre Columbian city north of the giant, you know, Mexican cities, you know, uh the Incans and the Mayans. Bad, a, 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 and the Aztecs. Aztecs. And... Huh. That's a, that is very specific. The largest uh pre Columbian city north of the <laughs> Mexico. But interesting. I'll have to look that up. That was about the time that um Leif Erikson showed up to north america i don't think he went that far west but and he was like really far north too yeah probably didn't encounter this group of eighteen thousand people it's not that's not actually a ton of people compared to the incan and uh mayan civilizations but still um all right so i'm gonna say i'm picturing like a new grange when it comes to like a mound made by people thousands of years ago and that's pretty big that was like uh well from the it was on it's on a hill so it's kind of tough to say like how tall it is it well a mound is essentially a man-made hill right but this new grange is a hill on top of a an existing hill uh um i don't let's say uh 200 feet 200 feet and this is about five feet so 40 40 pronghorns 40 pronghorns final answer yep the correct answer is about 20 pronghorns the mound oh. is 100 feet or 30 meters you julia your encouragement your... <laughs> give me strength <laughs> wow i th- i was initially going to go with uh, going to go with 100 and i was like that's a that's that seems large to me but that's probably like pitiful for a for a, a hill i mean I it's right. probably pretty good for like you moved dirt to be 100 feet tall without that's true without without a caterpillar like, or or even cattle or, or even like any beasts of burden in fact it's uh, quite amazing if you think about it they might have had the they might have domesticated the pronghorn <laughs> and, the uh, grizzly, and the grizzly bear <laughs> let's talk male weight they're between 40 and 65 kilograms or 88 to 143 pounds. How many pronghorns go into the estimated weight of the extinct giant bison? Ooh. We're talking Pleistocene things today. Here's a hint. The giant bison lived in the Pleistocene North America and preserved skulls and horns have been found by paleontologists. How would you like to be a Pleistocene paleontologist? Um, that is that is that sounds be- better than being like a Cretaceous paleontologist. What would like you what have if a you lot more a per- to work with? What if you were a particularly peculiar Pleistocene paleontologist? Also, the horns are much larger than modern bison, <laughs> and they look a little like a like a longhorn bull in terms of proportions. Uh, I'm gonna say fifteen. Fifteen prong horns. Fif- yep, that would put it at what, like, like what, twenty five hundred pounds? Yeah, that's nah, probably more than that. I'll say twenty. The answer is twenty, just like the first answer was twenty. Twenty prong horns. Final answer. Yes. Yes. Correct yes. answer is thirty point seven prong horns. Ah. Uh, the giant bison that's is thought to have weighed to... as much as two thousand kilograms or four thousand four hundred pounds. That would have been nuts. And it has like these huge long horns. Quite an animal. That sounds really dangerous. I'm sure it was. Considering the the just the, the nature and the disposition of a current bison, you definitely wouldn't want to annoy the giant bison. One that's twice as big with giant even gianter horns. Yeah, and 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 has never ever even once picked up the book of virtue. <laughs> he, they're definitely goofuses all 
All. What? They're all goofuses. None of them are galleons. Goof. Goof. Goofuses all. Uh, Is that it for Measure Up? That's it for Measure Up. All right. Well, let's talk about where this lives. You probably have guessed it from things like North America and Mississippi and Lewis and Clark. But they live in North America. Uh, both the on the eastern and western sides of the Rockies from Mexico to Canada. Uh, they stay mainly in the plain, but not in Spain. They like wide open fields, not forests. Uh, they like to uh, eat shrubs and the I mean they as grazers and ruminants they eat only plants but they'll also eat cacti um and the and the cud which means if you don't know what the, uh cud is it's when uh, a ruminant which is an animal that has a, a particular um chamber in its stomach uh will eat food particularly plants and um, then regurgitate that food and chew it again a second time uh, to make it easier for a digestion. Um, And in fact, animals that did this could not be uh, eaten by the Israelites. Because it's disgusting. That's a nasty thing to do, so don't eat it. Um, I'm sure they think digesting things once is disgusting. Yeah, look look at it from... Look at it from their perspective. How are you going to probably eat grass see us as not, superheroes? Not break it down anymore. Like, but we actually don't eat at grass, and then they go, <gasps> "What?" I think the important thing with grass. this regurgitation situation is that the the regurgitation situation that's a that's a seventies uh, album. <laughs> <laughs> this is the regurgitation situation station. The is is the fact that there's no stomach bile that comes up with this. They 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 swallow it into the um, uh, what is it's like the I think it's called the ruminary. Let me look it up. So it's not like when something repeats on you. And it's you... rumen. It's got it's got a lot of room in its stomach. Um, yeah. So it'll yeah it'll th- this is a special chamber where it's not being currently digested. It goes in there and then they regurgitate it up and chew it again and then and then it gets digested later. It would be. Not great for it if it actually threw it up with stomach bile and all. Um, all that the would time. erode your esophagus. And enamel. Yeah. So, for pronghorns, the females live in girls-only clubs, and the males live solitary lone wolf lives until it's time to mate. Males will either defend a fixed area that he hopes a gaggle will wander into, or they will defend the gaggle itself. Uh, they'll pick a group of girls to follow around, uh, like a lot of uh, animals do, or like we mentioned, the bighorn sheep do. I I I want to take this time to mention the fact that I, I I live in the suburbs in Jacksonville, and uh, last week there was we I was, I was feeding my son his daily rice cereal, and I look up and I I just see this brown shape moving toward. Like I, I can see out the sliding glass win- window in the backyard, and I see this brown shape moving toward me, and I initially think that it's a bear, uh, for a split second. But then I look up, and it's a it's a cow. Uh, so there's a there's a full grown cow now walking through my yard, which desperately needs a fence. I'm realizing, um, and then there was a, a smaller, a slightly smaller black steer, uh, following her. And uh, they they walked through our yard, into the neighbor's yard, into the forest behind our yards, and out of our lives forever. <laughs> Perhaps. Hopefully, um, yeah. There's a there's a ranch nearby, uh, and they own the, they own the forest that my our house uh, is adjacent to. So, um, I guess if there are no fences for them to 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 hem them in, I'm surprised this hasn't happened earlier. But yeah, so you know, close encounters of the bovine kind. <laughs> uh, but I when when I saw the steer following the the cow, I I immediately thought of our our um, bighorn episode where the males a male will just follow a female in heat until she's ready to mate, and that's what happens here. Although females, uh, female pronghorns 
will uh, sample males. So they'll go and just like hang out next to a male for a little while as they get closer to uh, estrus. And um, it, they'll they'll sniff glands. They'll uh, stalk their Facebook um, and decide whether or not this is like this is the guy for them. And I mean, not, it, it might not have on. been a steer if it was following her for that purpose. Um, what is a bull an uncastrated? Yeah, I guess. Cow? I guess I don't know if a bull is specifically uncastrated but a steer is specifically castrated okay it was not a steer it was definitely not a steer (laughs) (laughs) that that is clear clear clearly not a steer it's clear that this is no steer well it's clear as you leer that this is no steer (laughs) that this is definitely not steer superior to its peers so yeah that's how that's the the courtship rituals of the pronghorn and it's it, there are a lot of predators that the pronghorn has to worry about uh a lot of actually most antelope like things have to worry about a lot of uh predators and this is no exception uh it has to look out for coyotes wolves grizzlies bobcats cougars jaguars and even golden eagles mm-hmm. did we mention we've done the golden eagle right yes like this giant bird that like pushes goats off cliffs. Well, this is probably this is one of its, uh, one of its targets, like an eagle that'll just that'll that'll specifically target a large mammal. <laughs> uh, so, most of the time, well, we'll talk about that. Uh, but yeah, they're probably not gonna go after a full-grown male. It says they do they do prey on adults, but I imagine they use the same hunting strategy, which is if it's close to a ledge, you push it off and then eat it once it's dead. Not actually like full on assault, mano a mano. Although if you have like several three inch knives on your feet and you're flying, you know you could do some damage to even a big old pronghorn. Yeah, but they have two, like, six-inch spikes coming out of the tops of their heads. You just got to do a flyby. Yeah, you got to catch them unawares. But you're unlikely to kill them, so unless you, it's going to yeah, require several pushing. flybys. So I think the pushing thing is the, is the best route, if I was a golden eagle. Unless you do what I do in Dark Souls and really get close to a ledge and let very tough enemies fall off <laughs> you, che- you you gotta cheese him yeah <laughs> going right back to che- salt and cheese <laughs> all right and that's all that's all i got for uh, general info okay now that we're done with g- generalissimo info let's talk about major fact uh i'm calling this faster than the competition uh, pronghorns are among the fastest land animals in the world, and they're definitively the fastest runner in the Americas. Some say they could be the second fastest animal, land animal in the world, after the cheetah, of course. Hmm. They could reach speeds. I thought that would be uh, John Thompson's gazelle. Yeah, something that has to run away from a cheetah. Yeah, although <laughs> exactly, they're very, very maneuverable. So sometimes the gazelle can out, can can outmaneuver a cheetah. Uh, they can reach speeds as fast as 55 miles per hour or 85.5 kilometers per hour over a distance of half of half a mile. So this is obviously wow. slower than the cheetah's top speed at around 70 miles an hour. Uh, but, but it can't hold it for that long. But pronghorns are faster than cheetahs, cheetahs over long distances. Yeah. So while a cheetah and other high-performance runners exhaust themselves very quickly at those high speeds, the pronghorn can maintain high speeds for longer. So, for example, they can run 42 miles an hour for a whole mile and 35 miles per hour for four miles. Yeah, all they need to do is just not die in a a few seconds and they're good. Yeah, so their speeds make them untouchable to typical predators that try to chase them down in North America. Even wolves that hunt by 
dogging a single individual for miles can be left in the dust by a pronghorn. And I'm reading uh, White Fang now, and the opening to that book is kind of like this horrifying thing where two men are being, like, dogged by wolves. Where, like, a bunch of them, like, they're, they're, like, being surrounded by wolves and the wolves just kind of waiting for them to drop their guard. And what they'll do, dogs, like, well, even on the chase, wolves will, I think we've talked about this before. They'll have runners up front keeping pace with the animal they're chasing. And then people, people, wolves taking a break by jogging in the back. So you have this long line of wolves. So you never lose the prey, but you also maintain strength. And then once the animal stands its ground, you have some of the wolves like not letting the animal sleep. And the other ones are taking a nap so like eventually you wear that down the uh, much larger animals if you have a pack of wolves but the yeah i think we did that when we were talking about that one um what's the the small like dog african dog that can take down like massive prey yeah you know what those are called african wild dogs (laughs) is it did we do that I don't remember if we did them. They're very interesting. I I think we did. I'm pretty sure we covered that. Or did we just talk about them Um, when we talked about hyenas and stuff? No, I'm pretty sure we. Yeah, I think we did did because they are like that. We talked about how they have the highest uh, hunting success rate. Oh, it's the um, the dole or whatever. Oh yeah, that's O L E. I forgot, I forgot how we pronounced it. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. But it was taking down like much bigger prey. Yeah, the dole. Yeah, and and it would do this. What you were talking about, where it would, um, it would have runners and and allow allow the others to rest and stuff. Um, but even with that tactic, which is really successful a lot of the time. The pronghorn just leaves him in the dust. I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna run at car speed for four miles. Like, what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> so over the hills and far away. Other predators like eagles can pick off small pronghorns and even, I guess, like adult ones, uh, with air superiority. So it takes flight to be able to catch these guys. Um, but the animal with the most success in preying on pronghorns is the coyote. So the tactic that wins against pronghorns is ambush on migratory routes. So coyotes use stealth to pick off pronghorn fawns. Um, but some evidence suggests that pronghorn fawns have a higher survival rate in wolf territories. Because wolves are extremely hostile to coyotes in their territories. So because I, I, I haven't figured, I haven't read exactly why they just kind of just discovered that like for some reason, uh, pronghorn fawns are do better if there's wolves around. Um, and I, the only thing I can think of with my uh, non-expert brain is, um, that they wolves use tactics that are really, that are really ineffective against pronghorns. So wolves don't, you know, unless they're desperate don't go after pronghorns that much but they also drive off coyotes which do have success with pronghorns so i mean maybe that's why yeah it's kind of like the devil you know it's like hey i let's go hang out with the wolves because the coyotes are the worst <laughs> and wolves enemy, we can have my enemy is my coming. friend yeah uh so but why i'm surprised prong- that grizzlies can ever find ever catch them they run pretty fast though but in really short spurts so i think that like, must... what i saw was like they get they get caught on migratory paths a lot so like when there, there'll be like a line of a lot of them that something will just jump out of the bushes and take the something grizzlies down. aren't ambush hunters and i'm surprised grizzly, grizzlies are on this list actually and they also, uh, so like I saw, and, and they also get targeted um, 
directly after, during or after birthing. So after birthing, mothers, adult mothers will get taken because she's recovering. She's not as fast. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So like the, the makes sense for pre- most animals. These predators are like going after the pe- the the pronghorns in vulnerable situations. Um, but why are pronghorns so fast compared to the predators in their environment? So if you look at a pronghorn, it seems like it would fit better in Africa. It looks like its cousin. The antelopes of uh, kind of looks like Thompson's gazelle, maybe a little thicker version. Um, but this may be because they're relics of a time when North America looked more like Africa in terms of megafauna. So North American, uh, North America used to have lions, uh, large, lean, fast-running bears, which is horrifying, which uh, the short-faced bear, um, and then even cheetahs hmm. they had, and they they had hyenas too. So, cheetahs. yeah, there was a American cheetah, which preyed upon the prong pronghorns of old. So it's thought that the pronghorns developed their speed in a foot race with these faster predators. And though those faster predators have died off and left behind slower ancestors, the pronghorn never lost its ability to kick up smoke. So it's like it's like Usain Bolt, you know, they're just leaving everything in the dust. It's interesting. You'd think that with the um, adaptation, while while there's like a super fast predator, only the fastest would survive and make the entire species like super fast. But then once that was gone and they didn't need to be fast, then you would get this much wider spectrum of uh, of speeds that would allow you to survive. You would have it would slow down. Maybe they used to be faster. Yeah, you'd think like maybe they yeah, maybe they did. But uh they 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 haven't noted any like slowdown. Um I don't know, maybe it's the fact that like in the in the like 150 years we've been documenting them. I mean, what a bear can a bear can reach like a 30 bear. miles an hour, right? In a in a dead sprint. Yeah, not for very long though. No. And they're they're way a lot more opportunistic than the than people tend to think. They're not like they don't do a whole lot of active predation. Yeah, they like to eat uh, berries until the salmon come. I was reading that like a lot of black bear kills are opportunistic on pronghorns. Like they'll just come across a a mother that's birthing, and like oh, snack. Yeah, I can't. I can't see them uh, even. I can't see them uh, hunting them due to like the way, just the way they they eat. Um, and I definitely can't see it being successful unless they were there was some sort of situation like that. But also, black bears can find you two miles away with their nose. So like, you have to be able to run f- four miles pretty quickly to get away from a black bear true that really really wants to eat you um but that's all i got all right i had no idea that this was so fast i also didn't know that there were cheetahs in north america and like woolly rhinos back in the day oh i did did have all the coolest uh animals so did australia australia had super sloths so did we. Oh, did we? And by we, I mean the continent, which I have no Florida? ownership over. Florida? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's us, you know, North America. What, like, my, my ancestors were not even on this continent, like, five generations ago, so... <laughs> I think mine may have been. Anyway... Uh, yeah, so that was the pronghorn. The definitely not an antelope. Antelope. Definitely not an antelope. Uh, so, for you out there in Podcastia, stay mainly in the plane. Chew the cud and feel the need, the need for speed. Like the pronghorn here in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey, 
Hey, Taxonomy Titans. Thanks for listening to the episode. Just a few quick things. As always, reviews and social media engagement are greatly appreciated, but recommending the podcast to friends is the best way to help us grow. If you'd like some LDT-flavored merch, check out teespring.com slash stores slash taxonomy teas. That's it. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. podcast. <laughs>